Welcome to Resiliency Within. I am your host, Elaine miller Karras, and we are also live streaming on Resiliency Within's Facebook page, so you can join us there as well. And I want to start out by welcoming our most esteemed guest, Dr. Ravi Shankar. He is a Pushcart Prize-winning poet. He's going to tell us what that means because it's a very important um, uh, thing that happened to him, an editor of more than 15 books and, and chat books of poetry. He's the founder of Drunken Boat, one of the world's oldest electronic journals of the arts. He has been featured in the New York Times, NPR, the BBC, and PBS NewsHour. He lives in Providence, Rhode Island. His latest book, as I've mentioned, is Correctional, a Memoir, and it was published by the University of Wisconsin Press in January of 2022, so I'm so excited to have him as it's just being published and being set out into the world. In Correctional, Dr. Shankar frames his unexpected encounters with the law and the unraveling of his life through lenses of race, class, privilege, and his bicultural upbringing as the first and only son of South Indian immigrants. Vignettes from his life as a child in colorful Chennai and an, an angsty adolescent fighting against the model minority myth in Washington, DC, an emerging writer in Brooklyn and later an accomplished poet and academic set the scene for his spectacular fall and subsequent struggle to come to terms with his own demons. At, one, at once the story of what led to the incarceration and the revelations, both personal and societal, that come out of it Correctional challenges us to think the way we view and treat the previously incarcerated and to re-examine the justness of our criminal justice system. So welcome, Ravi. And as we start today, what's on your mind? Well, um, you know, I, of course, have been thinking so much about what's happening in, in Ukraine and thinking of the Ukrainian people. And um, I just uh, was on Twitter and I saw this little fact, which kind of puts things in perspective and brings it back to our conversation, I think. But um, the fact that um, Russia, and I was also thinking of Brittany Griner, the uh, WNBA player who's imprisoned over there. Yes. But they, uh, we in the US actually incarcerate uh, nearly twice as many people as Russia and nearly four times as many people as China. And um, so I just that just kind of put it into perspective when I was thinking about all oh, how um, unfair it must be over there and then thinking, wow, we have some problems of our own in this country. We have many problems of our own. And I also think if you look at the um, statistics of who is in in our jails and our prisons, um, it definitely demonstrates the injustice and equity and inequities in our system. So I know that I hope that you're going to elaborate upon that in terms of your own lived experience. You know, there's another question I want to ask you that um, that uh, just came to mind because as we we were talking in the Zoom green room before we started, uh, I was just you know kind of struck by there's a light about you if you could those of our Voice America in terms of how you talk about things in the world, and so I'm I'm wondering too with everything that's happened to you. Um, what makes you hopeful? What what brings what uplifts you and brings joy into your life? Before we start into some of the ingredients of what we're going to talk about today. Well, you know, I, I think when you go through some personally devastating moment and you come out on the other side, uh, you don't take for granted all of the things that you have. And so um, the uh, time I spend with loved ones, with my family, um, listening to music and taking a walk with my dogs, all of these things um, have brought me great joy. And I, I think also um, I can't really, and we'll talk about uh, this from the book, but I can't unsee what I've seen. And um, so many of the men that I met um, really made me realize there's this kind of um, shadow country that exists in the U.S. and um, has made me a lot more empathetic, whereas I think previously I might have been more judgmental. I feel this deep kinship and connection. I, I say in the book, we're all uh, indelibly, uh, ineradicably interconnected. And I, I really truly believe that. And I think um, going through what I have gone through has made me realize that in a kind of very visceral way. You know, I think, and you brought up the Ukraine, I, I, some of our, our um, listeners know that we've been doing a project through the Trauma Resource Institute in Ukraine for almost every single day since the 25th, um, which is shortly after the first bombing happened. And that's what I've been feeling more than ever, is as the horrific as war is, the work that we've been doing in the Ukraine and the Ukrainian people have really reminded me of the interconnectedness amongst all of us 
which is why war and injustice and equity is something that we have to look on with a really, you know, very precise lens of how we make a better world. So let, let me, I don't know if you have a comment to make before I ask the next question. Oh, yes, I was just going to say, I mean, and what a model of resiliency the Ukrainian people are. I mean, I'm kind of wowed by their courage. But then I also think about, you know, the fact that there was a genocide happening in Rwanda and war in Syria. None of that was really reported over here. And so the category of which whose victimization is more important is also a really kind of interesting thing to think about, I think. Well, you know, I think so. And how, how our press... And the media, I think, also um, enlighten us because I was just talking about the exact same thing that you just mentioned with a friend yesterday. And I was saying, you know, when the Rwandan genocide was happening, you know what was happening in the news in America? The O.J. Simpson trial. Uh -huh. And so people were, you know, glued to their television sets and here a million people were being, were being murdered in Rwanda. And in Syria, I don't even know the numbers, but we also, there's the Uyghurs are experiencing a genocide right now. Right. Um, so there's so many other conflicts. And I think too, as we look at even the Ukrainian war and what we're gonna talk about in our cities in the United States, every single day, there are young people and families, adults living in the fear of gun violence and not knowing is today gonna be my last day. And I've actually heard young people say, well, I don't know if I'm gonna be here tomorrow. So mm -hmm. I think when we look at the broader lens too, I hope that some of the illumination in terms of your lived experience can maybe help us think about how do we make changes to make this world better? Cause that's what I'm certainly got the sense from, from reading about the book. So yeah. let's get started then. So in 2008, you were pulled over on the pretense of a minor traffic violation called a sand nigger. I've never heard of that before by the police officer and kept in jail for 72 hours on a warrant for a five foot 10 white man. You're Indian and you are six feet two. That's quite a bit taller. Yes. <laughs> Yes. I, I weigh more too, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. than, uh... <laughs> so what effect did this, this experience have on, have on you? Well, you know, um, I lived in New York for a long time. I went to graduate school there and it's one of the first places that I felt truly at home um, because, you know, everyone from around the world is there. It's a kind of cosmopolitan place. And so um, this was after I had left New York and I was teaching at a university in Connecticut. I was a homeowner and father and going in for a literary event and um, to then be stopped when I was making a totally legal left turn and slurred and detained and not given a phone call in a place which I think Gosh. is one of the most open-minded uh, kind of liberal enclaves was a shock. Uh, it really was, it, it made me feel um, like I had lost a, a home in, in, in a certain way. Uh, and I, I guess what I didn't realize, and this is what maybe um, the effects of trauma had there. You don't just kind of go through something and get over it, but there are these kinds of lasting reverberations. And in my own life, I realized, I realize now in retrospect that I, I grew paranoid. And if I saw a police officer behind me on the highway, even if I was doing nothing, I'd take the next exit. Um, I also was starting to be a little bit more reckless. I think I was kind of drinking a little bit more. I didn't know how to talk to, especially um, friends of mine in academia, didn't really understand they're predominantly white. Um, what being racially profiled even was, they found it kind of hard to believe that I had been. And uh, so I, I, I think that, and it was at this time that I was also having difficulties in my marriage. And so all of these things kind of um, slowly built within me while I didn't even realize it. I, you know, when I came out, I was angry and I wrote some op-eds. I even sued the city. I won a minor settlement. Um, but none of that really addressed this feeling of violation that I felt. Uh, and come to find out, you know, I was caught up in a stop and frisk, which was later found to be unconstitutional by um, U.S. District Court Judge Shira Shindlin. But that, you know, by the time that I had been stopped, over 800,000 innocent New Yorkers had also uh, been stopped. And e even if you're not guilty of a crime, the effect of being stigmatized as criminal and not having your rights um, like you should has a pretty profound um, relationship to your attitudes about authority and about community and about a sense of safety in place. And I found all of that to be true. 
Well, and I think when you talk about safety too, I mean, that's something that's so important for all of us as human beings. And one of the things that, you know, I often talk about in the show is how our, our, um, our mind and body are connected to one another. And mm -hmm. so I'm, you know, I have, you know, the lens of you becoming more paranoid, of course you became more paranoid mm -hmm. because there's a part of your brain called the amygdala, it's your appraisal system, and you had a traumatic event. So it is designed to remember the things that could have led to our demise. And so, of course, if you saw a car, your amygdala is going, get the heck out of there, Robbie. And I mean, so it's so it's so logical. So this to me is not about um, the de deficiencies in us. It's mm. about how we protect ourselves. I, I'm putting a different frame around it. Um, yeah. but, but the consequences, I think the behaviors are what can also lead to our demise. And that's why trauma is not a benign or even saying, oh, I'm sorry. Because how does that change what happens within us? Yeah. And, you know, I think what I, I realized was that the trauma of that moment, unfortunately, was not the first time I had experienced overt racism. Um, you know, I grew up as a, a South Asian American. I was born in D.C. I'm, you know, an American citizen, but my parents immigrated from South India and the, uh, my father in the late 1960s and then my mother, who he had an arranged marriage with um, soon afterwards. Um, and we were probably the only Asian family in our little neighborhood in Manassas, Virginia. And so I had been kind of, you know, teased for what I wouldn't do for those delicious lunches my mother made me. But back then I was so embarrassed, I would dump it out on the way to the school oh. bus because I didn't want to be teased. And so, you know, I think that kind of stays with you as well. And um, something like what happened to me in New York kind of touched that wound that was still deep within me, even though I had, you know, been successful and I was in a job I really liked that I, there's still a part of me that felt like I didn't quite belong. You know, I yeah. when I was in India, I didn't really belong. And when I was in the US, I didn't really quite belong. And that feeling of exile, I think, was something that I felt. Well, and I think that's important to, for, for, I'm so glad you illuminated that because I think those microaggressions, sometimes not so micro, macro and microaggressions, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, I always think about our lives as tapestries and there's this tapestry, this grain that is part, and sometimes you don't even realize it until something maybe like this happened to you, right? And kind of the pieces get put together. So um, I'm just going to do you, I'm going to ask you, this wasn't one of our questions, but I just, it just came up. Do you have a sense of belonging now? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes. I mean, um, I think I had to, after all of this happened and I, the epilogue of the book, I kind of discussed this. I went to Australia. I got my PhD kind of looking at the roots of mass incarceration. And I fil finished work on this memoir correctional, which, you know, took a number of drafts. And those of us, those of uh, our <laughs> listeners who've done a book length project, it's excruciating. And especially <laughs> writing memoir, there's another uh, layer of unpeeling that happens every time. Uh, and then um, now I'm back in uh, Providence and, um, I, I, I have a, a, a great partner and I'm teaching at Tufts and I have some friends. And so I, I do feel like I am finding a place, but because, um, and this is another thing we can talk about, my, what happened to me subsequently was so widely covered in the news and I lost a lot of friends and people who um, I thought I was very close to. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, uh, you know, if you get uh, disease in some way, people keep their distance. And that's what it felt like for a while, that I was really radioactive uh, and that it's kind of taken me, I think, really looking deeply into myself uh, and taking responsibility for the mistakes I've made and making amends with the people I might have hurt to really mend some of those bridges. But unfortunately, I think some of those connections might be lost forever. Well, I think and that, that, that's my, the next question. So what responsibility do you take for your experience with the criminal justice system? Yeah, so after this first time where I was just, you know, totally innocent, uh, I started this to, to unravel a little bit. Um, I was a little bit more reckless and I ended up having uh, this trouble with my credit card unintentionally. I'm charged for soccer tickets I didn't attempt to order. Uh, and then I tried to resell them. And then I had got a DUI uh, and um, very stupidly um, was driving on a suspended license. And uh, I, it's something that I shouldn't have done. I live in Connecticut where I was taking Ubers everywhere. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to the grocery store should make a difference and just had a flat tire and a state trooper pulled up behind me and instead of asking for assistance, asked for my license and registration. And because I had this DUI, um, 
I violated the the terms of my probation, and I actually ended up as a result having to do a 90 day pretrial detention uh, at Hartford Correctional Center. Uh, and um, I certainly think, uh, and this is as I told my daughters, um, that if you don't follow the rules, there are these consequences. But then I also like to put it into context because those 90 days that I ended up serving, the same amount of time that uh, the Stanford swimmer who raped an unconscious Chanel Miller had to do. And I had a very highly paid attorney. And so it made me realize that there are different systems of justice that, that exist. And I don't know, I mean, it, I hadn't been convicted of anything. It was a pretrial detention to satisfy the state. It was always such an ominous phrase when I would hear it, as if the state was some goddess that needed to be propitiated with human sacrifice or something. Uh, and, uh, you know, it made me think, well, what what is really the purpose of um, this time I'm having away from my family? Um, it, it is certainly did I take responsibility for the mistakes that I've made, but it also made me question the, the uh, efficacy of the system of incarceration. And certainly based on my experience, I would come to find out that my uh, fears were in fact very realized because there was a lot of problems in there. So, so can I ask you just another question about like, I know this thing had the second the second thing happened, but you also say something about the media. You had a very different experience with the media. So what happened with that? And, and what did it teach you about the limitations of mass media? Yes, you know, um, I, and I'm someone who, as a, as a writer, you always want and hope to be covered by the, the media. And I was already <laughs> a little bit of a semi-public figure. I'd been on the radio and published my books of poems. And um, when this happened, it just so happened to coincide with the year that I was going up for promotion to full professor. I taught at a state university in Connecticut. And uh, uh, this 90 days that I had to do was actually um, my lawyer, and this is why I did have a paid attorney, not a public defender, managed to get it spaced out over about a year and a half so that it wouldn't interfere with my teaching schedule. And that one summer, which I write about in my book, I spent 45 days in Hartford Correctional and then I get on a plane and fly out to Hong Kong to teach graduate students out there. And I'm having drinks with the ambassador and the top of the Ritz Carlton. Then I get back on a plane to go and do two more weeks at Hartford Correctional. And so it was like that uh, in the book, I mentioned the parable of the philosopher who dreams he's a butterfly and he wakes up and he doesn't know if he's a butterfly dreaming he's a philosopher or, or vice versa. And that's kind of uh, how that felt. Um, so, but the media didn't really pick up on it until the very end of these 90 days when I was finishing everything off, my promotion, had, um, I'd exceeded expectations on every level and had been signed off on by the chair, dean, provost, president, and just needed to be rubber stamped by the board of regents. And it just so happened that a, a former Republican legislator turned Hartford current columnist got a hold of it. And it became then huge news. And I guess there's a certain um, alliterative appeal, poet and professor promoted while in prison. But I realized it was really because the Board of Regents is appointed by the Democratic governor. It was an election year. And I became a very convenient kind of political football to use to say, oh, isn't this um, administration they have someone? And, and I was painted in this pretty vile sensation, sensationalistic way. I mean, my friend said, sounded like I was a wild animal escaped from the zoo, running amok, causing havoc. And what I realized is once an initial story was established, there's little room for nuance and complexity in uh, modern journalism. And there's this phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. And so, you know, you want page clicks. And um, there isn't really room to, um, you know, no one talked about my many years as an award-winning educator, um, for example, um, but it was all concentrated on these things that I'd done. And actually also, um, Connecticut's pretty sleepy. You know, I was just a misdemeanor offense and my friend in New York said, if you lived here, no one would have even cared. But in Connecticut, they sent camera trucks and um, news helicopters to my home where my daughters were waiting for the school bus. And so it was humiliating and overwhelming. And I really did have kind of a breakdown when it was all happening, to tell you the truth. And so what helped you get through that breakdown, Robbie? How did you get through that? 
Well, I think part of it was um, having a really uh, supportive network of friends. Uh, and um, I had this Buddhist therapist who uh, I, I could talk to. But then I also, as a writer, and this is what was has been so cathartic about writing this book, and I'm a huge believer in bibliotherapy, and the fact that writing about your life and taking control of your story again can help you heal. Uh, and so I did write, um, I wrote a little op-ed in the Hartford Current, uh, The Eight Things I Learned in Jail. Uh, and I published it. And it was, uh, you know, um, from everything from the racial composition of the people around me to the ingenuity of some of these men and what they were able to achieve. And my uh, wondering if they had resources in place. Some of them had substance abuse issues or mental health problems. Um, they didn't belong in prison and they weren't being helped in prison. No. And so... Uh, you know, I kind of, um, that also, I think, uh, helped me heal. But I, I, there were other ways in which my, the members of my department, I think, were very upset at me. They thought I had kind of cast the department in a negative light. And um, it, that became kind of toxic. And I lived in a small, um, quintessential New England village, where I was probably already half the population of color was me. And so I was already pretty well known. And after this happened, I just felt like, it's a strange feeling. Um, no one will meet your eyes, and yet it feels like everyone's staring at you all the time. Uh, so did, is how I describe was it. There, <laughs> was there? Was there? I mean, if this is. I mean, this is really a horrific story because here, I mean, when you talk about what you did, the misdemeanor, I can't tell you. I mean, I'm not saying you know this is not an excuse for a DUI, of course, but I mean, I know many people who that have has this has happened to them, and they haven't necessarily served 90 days in jail. They've They've had to, you know, go to a diversion course or whatever it is. Um, but I, I think to me that almost the way people treated you was worse than the 90 days that you spent um, incarcerated. I mean, to have your colleague shun you, it sounds almost like a shunning. Um, so was there anyone that showed you compassion during that time amongst the faculty that you were working with? There was, um, and the, this is the amazing thing, right? If you uh, go through trauma, it's almost a litmus test to see who you can count on. And so some people I didn't even know very well stepped up in a big way. Uh, and other people I thought were my closest friends kind of backed away. Uh, and so I did have, uh, and I had also um, done a lot to help develop the creative writing program there. And I think it was quite popular with the students. Um, so there, there were some people who definitely uh, were, were supportive, but it's, it's funny, this is a power of the mass media. Most people see something in the paper and, and they believe it. And, you know, when I was in Australia and the U.S., and it's state by state, I guess, but it's one of the few places, Connecticut, um, or one of the many places in the U.S. where you can publish all of the personal details of someone just when they've been um, arrested or uh, of something, not even convicted. Um, and in Australia, until there's a conviction, that information is kind of private, right? Because if you get huh. acquitted... Um, and, you know, when my cases were finished and uh, some of the stuff was resolved and dropped, uh, none of that was ever reported. Um, it was only a, a, this initial stuff. And so there was a it wasn't of, sensational anymore. So that it, it wasn't, wasn't. Yes. But you know what I love what you said about, you know, in terms of your healing is when you started writing and mm -hmm. you got to write the elements of your own story to tell your own story, because then it wasn't the media story. It was your truthful story. That's for you. right. Yeah. So. And, it, and it became, I think, not just my story. And this is what I uh, mentioned in the book, but um, some of the men I met, and this is the silver lining for me, is that I encountered people I never would have in my normal life. And I got to know them. They shared some personal stories of their hopes and dreams and how they got embroiled uh, in the criminal justice system. And they made me promise them that I would do something with them. Those stories, they said, you have a voice, no one cares about us. And, uh, you know, and I really um, feel like um, helping them. Uh, and I think there's this therapist, Elaine Scary, and she talks about how suffering and physical pain does not simply resist language, but actually destroys it, bringing about an immediate reversion to a state anterior to language. And I found that that was the case that many of these men wanted to have tools to help get better. They wanted to take classes, they wanted to get their GED. And yet what they were encountering on the inside 
was um, dysregulation, was an inability to access the things they needed, the resources they needed to grow. Um, it was almost, and it, it feels to me, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it almost felt like there was an investment in a system that was built to fail. Um, that was my feeling at this time. I'm a college professor, and one of the first things uh, that I did was volunteer to teach in, in the school, and all of my requests were ignore, ignored. I do talk about one person I met, Chaos. Everyone in there had nicknames. Uh, it, it was a sign that you fit in, and uh, Kendrick, as Chaos as he was known, um, was uh, lived on the streets, had been kicked out by his parents, was functionally illiterate when I met him, and um, I taught him to write his first words, which is one of the great um, teaching moments of my life, I think. Uh, you know, Ravi, as, as you're, as you're telling, as you're telling me this story, I mean, I have just, I have tears in my eyes right now because you know, isn't it so interesting in life? Sometimes the very worst thing that we think that happens to us ends up being one of the most illuminating things for our life and changes us in ways that we could never even imagine. That has actually been richer for our lives. It's been more, more nourishing than we could ever example. I, I guess I'm saying that about myself. But when you say those words, I can't. I mean, when you say how you helped him to write, what a moment! And he he ended up stitching this little handkerchief for, for his daughter Aaliyah, and those were the first letters he'd written. And it, yeah, it, it moved me nearly to tears. You know, the Japanese have this um, uh, phrase kintsugi, which were in Japanese ceramic. When you're making something and the perfectly symmetrical bowl cracks, instead of throwing it away, they like to inlay it with gold and call Seamless. attention to the imperfection and it becomes rare and more valuable. And I love that idea that the scar can become a source of beauty in some yes, way. Yes, I love that too. I think Rumi has something with that the wound is where the light enters. Yeah. I, I, I love I love that. I mean, I think it's it's a similar thought. Um, we're gonna take a break in just a uh, in just a minute or so. And I want our listeners to know we are going to come back and talk, do a deeper dive in the experiences of when you were um, with these gentlemen in, in prison and give us some more stories about how, um, you know, the different factors in society come together and maybe influence, you know, people being incarcerated. But I really am um, really interested in when they, you said you have to write about us later, I'm going to be really interested in finding out the kinds of things what happened besides helping him to, to learn how to write his daughter's name in prison? What other kinds of things came from this? Yes, absolutely. Well, I guess I look forward to sharing. Yes. So we are going to take a we're going to take a short break and we'll be back with Dr. Ravi Shankar. And he is going to um, talk to us in more detail about this experience and about all the riches, I guess those are my words again, um, the riches that came from this very difficult life experience. So we'll be back in just a few moments with Ravi Shankar. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Ravi Shankar, and we are talking about his memoir that was just published in January called Correctional, a memoir. And so where can they find this book, um, Robbie, if they want to buy your book? And, and also, there might be a website or something where they can learn more about your work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Correctional is published by University of Wisconsin Press. And if you can get it at your local independent bookstore, I encourage you to do so. Although I know the press is out of copies, which is a good thing. So Amazon does have copies and uh, you can always get copies from them. And uh, they have the ebook as well. And you can learn more about my own work. I'm, Elaine had mentioned I'm a poet and a translator. Uh, my website is poetravishankar.com. And I'm on the socials um, at Impurpler. Um, which is what I was called in graduate school once, an over impurpler of language, which I probably was, but I decided to own it and take possession of it. Oh, that's well, that's, kind of, that's an interesting, kind of, an interesting name. Well, the other thing I want, I, I don't want to forget this. What does it mean to be a pushcart, a pushcart prize winning poet? Oh, well, the, the, the Pushcart Prizes are an annual award given to the best of the small presses. Uh, and so it is a really a very highly um, competitive competition. Uh, and um, every year there's an anthology called the Pushcart Prize Anthology where they pick um, supposedly the best poems and stories and uh, essays of the year. And so I had been nominated a couple of times and um, some years back I actually won. So it was a very exciting moment. Well, because I heard that some people that are just even nominated like to put that on their 
their curriculum vitae. So you not only were nominated, you won. So I just, yeah. I just have to say, isn't that wonderful? So congratulations <laughs> for that. <laughs> All right. Well, so let's get back into some of the questions that we were, some of the things we were talking about before the break. And let me ask you one um, before we get into talking more about um, some, some more of the elements of the men you met in jail, but what did this experience um, tell you about racism in America? Wow. Um, I know this is such a small question. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I'm actually thinking about this from a couple of different angles because um, part of, um, you know, this time that I spent in Australia made me realize, I mean, they over there begin all of their events with what's called uh, a welcome to country and an acknowledgement of the original stewards of the land. And they kind of name the indigenous people who were there and thank them for the use of the land. And I know some of my Australian friends think that it's a uh, lip service and it doesn't really mean much but i was as an american always really moved when i heard that and i wondered what if we did something similar and acknowledged um the slaves on whose back the wealth of the nation was built and the indigenous people that lived on the land um i think we're in a you know when president obama was elected there was a lot of hope that we're moving into this post-racial america but i think we've never really fully addressed the original sin uh, of slavery, and we haven't had an honest conversation about it. And therefore, I think racism in America has become kind of embedded in institutions like uh, the criminal justice system, where, um, you know, we talked about some of the numbers, uh, you know, and this is the other thing is this is a really relatively modern phenomenon. This is like a, a social problem of our time, because in, in 1980, uh, there were probably about 250,000 people who were incarcerated. And even with the population increase last year, there's about 2.2 million. So almost a 800% increase in the last 40 years. And when you see who is being incarcerated, uh, there you're, uh, according, eight times more, the, the great quote, the shocking quote is from Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, which is a ter terrific book. And they found that if you were an African-American male born in 2001, you had a one in three chance uh, of being arrested. Uh, and um, so it is really, I, and I think it's not, this is where I think there's a certain kind of um, intentionality. It's not a coincidence that the two great moments of explosion in prison growth in American history, one came at the end of the Civil, Civil War uh, in the post-Reconstructionist South, where all of a sudden there were these freed men who they wanted to um, re-imprison and have them work on plantations again. There was even the uh, convict leasing system where states could get prisoners from other states to do the work no one else wanted to do to dig railroads and ditches uh, and then the other big moment as i mentioned in 1980 well what did that come after well civil rights movement right and so mm -hmm. under the uh, ages of the war on drugs and um other policies not just in incarceration but housing right redlining um voting uh, the ways in which um, you're disenfranchised and th things are redistricted. Um, all of these elements are at play. And so when we have a discussion about, I know people don't think that we kind of play the race card too easily. And I always like to, I say, let's not talk about opinions. Just let's look, just look at the facts. Let's look at what the per capita income of a Black family is in America. I think uh, something like 33,000 and less than uh, three times as little what a white family is. And it's interesting for me because I actually, Indian Americans actually have the highest per capita income. And so I have this interesting, as an Asian American, I think I'm kind of on both sides of the divide. And that's part of what makes this story of correctional uh, unique in some ways. But um, I, yeah, I, I just like to look at those different statistical measures to say, well, this is how far off from equity we really are. I mean, once we kind of can get these things closer together, then we don't need things like critical race theory or these conversations. But until we're able to have, um, because in the U.S., no matter where you're born, you should have the, the equal right to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And unfortunately, depending on where you're born and who you're born to, and um, you know, a lot of the people I met had parents who had been incarcerated. And there's this kind of generational effect um, that happens. And of course, what happens to the children when one of their parents is away from them for extended periods of time. Um, and so, you know, some of this, I think there is this kind of 
Puritan puni punitive streak in the American character where we want to punish and shame. And I feel like, really, that's not a useful model. And these people who are going to come back into society. And so instead to uh, rehabilitate and forgive, right, to engage with the compassion instead of um, kind of shaming people, I think is a, a far more productive, both personally and socially. Uh, you know, this is why I, I feel like it's not a Republican or Democratic issue. No. Um, it's costing taxpayers. I mean, in, in Rhode Island, where I am, I think it's about $75,000 a year that's spent on each prisoner. And about three quarters of those costs are on security and administration. And I feel like, gosh, if I was given $75,000 to help each of these people, I could probably do a better job um, because they... They're, they're crying out for help. And instead of giving them help, what they're getting is more abuse, more stigmatization. And it is not, that's probably why uh, the US has one of the highest rates of recidivism of any country in the developed world, um, because we're not equipping these people. It's almost like, like I said before, that we want them to fail in some way. Well, I think you, what you said about the system was made long ago. And I think it does have that Puritan ethic of punishment and shame. And I think this is the other reason why many people that I work with, and we certainly believe this in the Trauma Resource Institute, is being trauma-informed. Because trauma-informed asks the question, what happened to you? It's, and you know, kind of conventional thinking says, oh, well, you just did something bad. You have to be punished. Mm. But if we don't ask what happened to you, like you said, oh, this is a, a his, this, they have, we have history. Their parents were in prison. Who was who was caring for them? I mean, if we don't change that 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 trajectory, then it's just going to repeat itself. But I think the other thing that strikes me about you know what you said is the honest truth of it. So you just gave us some facts. Some of those facts were new facts for me, and I tried to keep up on these things. But if we don't know the true facts, how can we then say, okay, well, how do we change the system if this is reality? I mean, I'm thinking also, I was very struck that I'm, I'm pretty well educated. I didn't know anything about the, um, the murder of African-Americans in Oklahoma um, during that Black Wall Street back in, was it 1921? Yeah. yeah, I'm going, how can I be as old as I am in my 60s and not know that? And so to me, that's not saying the truth because that it truly has been whitewashed, hasn't it? Yeah. And if we don't have the truth, then how can we create policy and change? And I guess, you know, I'm going to jump, I'm going to come back, but I want to kind of, this kind of fits into the question is what do you think we, how do we change the criminal justice system? What do you think are some of the ideas after having this experiences that you've had and what you've thought about since? Yeah, you know, that's such a great question. And I've been on panels with people who are prison abolitionists who feel like the system is too far broken and others that think that we need to look at Scandinavian countries like uh, Norway and Denmark, which have very low rates of recidivism. Um, I, I will say that in that Norwegian system, they treat the prisoners really humanely. Um, and so you're kind of given a space, you're um, asked to learn a trade, you can cook your own meals, you have a key to your own little apartment. I mean, some of those Norwegian uh, jails actually are far nicer than uh, brownstones I lived in Brooklyn, I think. But um, I say that semi facetiously because I think that the net effect is that it has one of the lowest rates of recidivism. These, and there are no death penalties or life sentences. So these men and women are gonna be coming back into society. Um, so looking at some of these alternate models, but then kind of also really asking ourselves, I mean, I think putting some of resources into more um, community health organizations, mental health organizations, um, to substance abuse counseling, um, and certainly, uh, arts programs, I think, are so healing and therapeutic. And I have since been teaching writing workshops at the um, York Correctional Center and other places. And I have found that the more people are able to kind of think about and own their story, as we said, and write about their experiences, the more they are able to heal and they're less victimized and they are able to take control. Um, and I think that really helps trauma. Uh, as well. And then I think there needs, just needs to be a shift in perception. I mean, while, while this has been happening, when I talked about this almost 800% increase in the prison population, 
crime rate stayed constant. It's not as if we were getting any safer. Um, and so I think instead of, um, I think we have a tendency to kind of think of people as um, black and white, as good and evil. Um, someone who has uh, committed a crime is a criminal. And um, instead to say they may have been guilty of doing something, but they paid their debt to society and we wanna help them reintegrate. Because the other thing I found is not just while you're incarcerated, but when you're on probation, when you're on parole, there are multiple obstacles put in your way um, from when you have to see your probation officer to living in a halfway house to certain jobs that you can't hold. Um, Re-entry programs that I've worked with tell me that the only jobs that they, they can get are in retail or flipping burgers. Um, and so, um, you know, how can we kind of, uh, we live in a society where we talk about intentional inclusion, which is a really good thing, including people of different genders and races and uh, ages in our workforce. And I think we also need to talk about including people who might have a criminal record, um, who might have made a mistake and that they are atoning for and trying to, to move forward from. Um, because the entire idea um, is not that someone needs to be punished for their entire life, but that they can become a, a productive member of society. And you know, I guess that is because it sounds like from what you're saying, it's not only the punishment of spending time incarcerated, but then afterwards, if you almost have like the scarlet letter of felon or I've been in prison, then you can't get the kinds of maybe employment where you feel like you're making a meaningful contribution. So then the system just, I mean, if, if your job doesn't have meaning for you, think about the, all the different things. I mean, writing poetry or being a professor or the different things you do, how that gives you meaning as a human being. How do we, how do we help people create meaning in, in their lives um, and get inspired? But when you say that you did the writing workshops so, and you've seen shifts happen with that. So can you talk a little bit, maybe, I wanna make sure we have enough time because you really wanted to talk about some of the people you met in jail yeah. and, and what you learned from them. So I don't, I, want, I, I don't think we're gonna have time for all the questions we planned, but I think that seems to be an important one. Yeah. How they've, you know, they've touched your lives and inspired you. Yeah, I, I, I guess what I realized, and of course, when I first went in, I was petrified. You know, the only thing I knew about jail had been watching TV shows like Oz, Prison Break. And I just wanted to kind of just disappear into the wall. And because that first stint, I did 45 days. And you really, it was, I wasn't in a cell. I was in a dorm with 60 other men. There were two dorms next to each other, 120 in total. Probably 95% of the men around me were men of color. They were African American or Hispanic, uh, and um, you are on these bunk beds. And the space that three bunk beds makes together is called your cube. And so you get to know your cube mates pretty well. And as we started talking, I realized, oh, these men are have some of the same dreams. They have children that they are caring for. Uh, they have places that they want to visit. Um, they have family um, mm -hmm. who are missing them. And um, it made me all of a sudden say, oh, well, these, these are not monsters any more than I'm a monster. And in fact, um, these are uh, people who have these really interesting stories and for whatever reason um, have ended up here. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, met, I mentioned chaos. He was, uh, I, he broke my heart. He was probably one of the most emotionally transparent people I've ever met. And so he, he, there was no subterfuge about him. Whatever he was feeling, you could see it on his, his face. face. He could have been an Oscar winning actor, mm -hmm. you know, speak of which we just saw the Oscars last night. Um, but uh, he told me, I mean, his story, and he was someone who was self-confessed um, uh, drug dealer and a pimp and really tough and hard. And um, But um, he, when in a private moment, told me about his life how he spent an entire winter in the back of uh, his uncle's Buick with crushed beer cans and how his uh, parents hadn't wanted him and kicked him out and how he had to kind of live uh, homeless on the streets for a while, how he couldn't get his high school education. And so all of those things, the trauma of that uh, and not having any support on the inside. He, he said that he had wanted to counseling and he hadn't been able to find it. Um, you know, uh, I met someone else, Leonard, who is a, he was a Vietnam War vet, who, uh, you know, had, um, uh, had some drinking problems after that. 
Um, I met a dapper old grandfather who told me, and again, you know, I say uh, that when you're on the inside, my, my BS meter was kind of busted. I <laughs> yes. couldn't tell who was telling the truth. <laughs> Uh, everyone says they're innocent for the most part, but you know I did meet this very dapper uh, grandfather who had been uh, arrested for jaywalking. I didn't even really think that that was still a crime, but he said, you know, the neighborhood I come from, it's over policed. There are there are constantly cop cars there, and they're looking to, um, you know. And I think this is a thing. I mean, when you build more prisons and private prisons, then you need bodies to fill them with when you expand your police forces and give them the most sophisticated kind of military equipment, they're going to want to use it. They're going to want to justify their budgets by making arrests. And so it does become this kind of vicious cycle in, in a lot of ways. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as you, you know, what you're doing now, I mean, you've you mentioned a few things. So what is your life like now? I mean, I know you, you're you a very uh, esteemed poet and writer. You've just, you know, it sounds like this was a very important book for you to write and all the thoughts that came out of these 90 days of your life and, yeah. you know, sharing stories. I mean, it was only 90 days and look what came from it. I guess that's what I'm struck by. Um, so what's yeah, happening well, in the know, here the and now? Is a, a day inside feels like a year. Does it? Okay, well, I'm uh, never, so there you go. To... So 90 days seems a lot longer than that. I don't mean to minimize the, yeah. the amount of time, but I'm just saying is that, you know, in terms of one's life, yeah. it's three months of your life, and it seems like it really puts you on a new thought process and mm. a journey that would probably not have happened for you if, if your life, if you hadn't gone to the store that day. Yeah, you know, I think that um, it, it really has made me realize that I'm both someone who's benefited from enormous privilege. Um, my parents chose to immigrate to this country, and I went to some of the finest schools and uh, have a, a good middle class life. Uh, and yet, I'm also someone who sh shared in common the fact that I was discriminated against um, because of the color of my skin. And that there was a kind of similarity there um, that I didn't really realize. And um, coming out of it has just kind of opened my eyes and heart in a big way so that people I might have looked away from, uh, I now want to reach out towards. Um, I've been doing some work, uh, not just at York, but at, um, in Rhode Island, there's this uh, great uh, program, Harvest Kitchen, where um, the uh, DCF, the youth, uh, are actually given culinary skills uh, and conversation. And I taught a, a poetry writing workshop there. Um, I'm teaching at uh, Tufts University, um, creative nonfiction and poetry and journalism. And I you know, live in, in Providence. And um, I, I feel, I mean, now, fine, I mean, for a long time, and I didn't even really talk about there's, the thing about correctional is there's a lot of threads to the story. And so I also talk about my parents' immigration um, from South India and uh, my own journey back to India uh, when I was a young boy and in, in a lot of cultures, but in South Asian culture, certainly, if you go through something traumatic, um, the, uh, the common uh, response is to dig the deepest hole you can imagine and you push and repress it down as far as you can and you heap a bunch of dirt on it and you never mention it again. And that was why when my mother found out I was working on this book, she couldn't believe it. She said, you know, you survived those years. Why would you want to rehash it and, and bring it all back? And uh, I guess as a writer, I had no choice. I knew um, I would have to, in order to survive, do something to, to kind of do an ethnography and a record of this time and of the people that I met. But it was also just really important for me to kind of look at my story, both from the inside and introspectively, but from the outside and um, see um, the larger American journey that we're in and the part that we play, each of us in our society, um, in kind of making a better country and how we can accomplish that. And um, so I guess I, I, that has really, I mean, those, um, those men have made me um, somewhat of an activist because I, I, I feel like I want to help them. I, I, think, help I think you're more than somewhat of an activist, <laughs> Robbie. I think you're more than that. But I, you know, so as you, as you go forward, what are your hopes for, I guess, each one of us here, we're in our last couple of minutes says, you know, as American, what would you say to someone who's saying, 
oh, I'm really hearing what he has to say. How can I help change this system? Yeah. So if you can so, just give us a parting thought in a minute or so. Uh, I yes, absolutely. I know that's hard. <laughs> well, and I do hope, I mean, those of you that read Correctional, that it's not just a literary artifact, but something that spurs you into action. And the great thing is that there are so many people and organizations from national ones like the Sentencing Project, the Marshall Project, the Southern Law Poverty Center, to really local ones. I mean, I just did some research and I discovered also a great organization, Rhode Island Garden Time, that brings gardening skin, skills in. Um, and uh, of course, writing to your legislators, right, to advocate, because I think we're the taxpayers, we're funding the system. The system is not working. It, it's broken. The rates of recidivism show that. The over structural racism shows that. And so if we want to have a voice in changing it, we have to make ourselves heard. And I'm a big proponent of not just liking the occasional Facebook post or retweeting something, that just is kind of making us complicit in a system that wants to keep us inert, but to actually go out and get involved and to try. I mean, it's been hard for me to do and I practice doing this every day, um, but to see the humanity that we share with one mm. another. You know, uh, I noticed that um, you just put your hand to your heart when you said oh, that. Mm. So um, many of you know that I'm a big believer in these spontaneous gestures that come up. And oftentimes when we put our hand to our heart, we're talking about things that have great meaning for us. Oh. So Dr. Ravi Shankar, thank you so much for being on the show. And I want everyone to go out and buy your book. So say the name of your book and where they can get it again and how to get in contact with you. I'm going to have it one more time. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Lane. This has been a, a true joy. Uh, the book is Correctional, a memoir. It's just out with University of Wisconsin Press. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter or, or Instagram at, at Imperpler. And I'm here in, in Providence, but happy to go anywhere um, to share my story and to be of assistance in any way that I okay, can. Okay, well, you, you're saying that. So, you know, I'm going to connect you up with the many folks that you may actually do that with. And I have to say, well, I am now a fan. So um, <laughs> see what we can do together to also help to change the world. I think that's what we're both interested in. And for our listeners, maybe a family member or you or your, you yourself have faced um, being incarcerated. Um, remember what else is true. Remember some of the hardest, darkest hours, sometimes just remembering that bowl and how the gold is filled in or Rumi's quote of, you know, where um, the light enters is from the wound, that that's possible for all of us. Um, so remember what else is true in your life and what, how you might be able to contribute to making change, not only for yourself, but for others. So until we meet again, this is Elaine miller Karras. Again, a big thank you to Dr. Ravi Shankar. I'm going to have to have him on again because, you know, he has a, there's another famous Dr. Ravi Shankar and I know he has, he has gone to the heavens, but <laughs> you have the same name, but we'll come back and talk about that again sometime. So in any event, this is Elaine miller Karras signing off for Resiliency Within today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs>